Just going to run down real quickly the books within the Colbrin Bible, the Book of Creation, the Book of Gleanings, the Book of Scrolls, the Book of Sons of Fire, the Book of Manuscripts, the Book of Morals and Precepts. That's very interesting, by the way. The Book of Origins, the Book of the Silver Bow, the Book of Lucius, the Book of Wisdom, the Book of Britain. But it's in the Book of Gleanings that we will glean a little piece we'll read to you next about the two competing races early on in the story of the Colburn Bible as we get deeply into the story of creation in the Colburn. There was the race of men known as the children of God and the race known as the children of men. And then a couple others that were scattered about. It's the conflict that they have that will surprise you. And it's what makes the children of God so good that will completely surprise you. At least it did me when I read it. And I'll read it to you coming up next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. Well, we all know about Glenn Kimball's work with Ancient Manuscripts. Ancientmanuscripts.com is Glenn's website. You can not even bother with trying to spell that just by linking up to coast to coast am.com and going to the page for Glenn. The Colbrin is the book. And Glenn, I want to read part of what I like. I think it's before the, uh, the Adam and Eve story, but I can't remember exactly because I, you know, dog eared so many pages in here. Okay. This is about the race of men that came out of the cold Northlands, which is interesting, isn't it? Uh, They were under a wise father, and above them was the Grand Company, which later withdrew in disgust. The Grand Company sounds like it was some sort of ruling body or something. Yeah. Uh, This race that came out of the cold Northlands was the children of God. They knew truth and lived in the midst of peace and plenty. The children of men about them were wild and savage. So we have two different groups, the children of God and the children of men. The children of men were clothed in the skins of beasts. They lived like beasts. Even more wild were the men of Zumat, who lived beyond them. Among the children of God, and this is the part I thought was fascinating, it totally surprised me, woman had equality with man. For her counsels were known to be wise. Now, I'm all good with women being equal. It just surprised me to see it in in such an ancient manuscript. Because that certainly wasn't the culture of, you know, Edward I. That wasn't British culture for a very, very long time. But then they speak to something which I think is really profound here. When they go on to say why women were considered wise and why they held their power. Uh, They talk about women being wise, and it says that she heard with understanding, and her speech was considered. In those days, her words were weighed, for then her tongue did not rattle in her head like seed in a dried pod. So they're implying that sometime later on, women weren't as smart. But then it goes on to say this, woman knew that though man could subdue her with his strength, He was weak in his desire for her. In his weakness lay her power. And in those days, it was used wisely. It was the foundation of the people. The race was good, but because of its goodness, it was destined to be smitten. For only the good vessel is worthy of the fire. So, A, somehow women were able to recognize that Their greatest strength over men came in the fact that men wanted to have sex with them. So they used that power and that time and that desire uh, to get men to act better. And that that's what was the foundation of the these uh, these people that were good, the children of God. I thought that was amazing. Wouldn't Margaret Starbird love that particular passage? Yeah, that's interesting. I think a lot of people would just look at that and go, how old is it? Because this sounds like it was written 
you know, 15 years ago, not 1,500 potentially years ago. Well, obviously, Margaret Starbird would tell you that the origins of of, uh, of uh, Western Christianity began with a, a very feminine presence. She writ, she wrote the book The Goddess and the Gospels. Right. Uh, and and the Nakamadi Library has a uh, one text called the Pista Sophia or the Great Sophia, which was the Mother in Heaven. We talk about Father in Heaven, uh, but we've totally extricated. Uh, all the writings and advice from Mother in Heaven, uh, which I find to be a, an aberration, uh, more reflective of our day and not of the ancient times. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, I, I, one, one point when you talked about her tongue wagging in her head, you've got to be careful. You and I are, are both married, aren't we? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I do, but I should, it's that idea, first of all, that metaphor was an interesting one. Her tongue didn't rattle in her head like a seed in a dried pod. I mean, that's a great metaphor for anybody who just is talking without, you know, particularly worried about how or what they're saying. But but I, I just thought it was – I'm really compelled by this. I mean, the, the children of men who are the kind of the evil ones here or the stupid ones, they say they treated women as a chattel. She was subject to man, an object for the satisfaction of his lust and the servant to supply his needs. But then it goes on to say, the children of God valued woman highly and protected her from crudeness and cruelty, and her standing was such that she was awarded only to the most worthy of men. They held her in respect, for to them she was the fountain of life within their race, the designer of its future. What a, what a magnificent philosophy, and to think that this was held... Uh hundreds and hundreds of years ago and written thousands of years ago probably uh is a reflective of our contemporary how how societies have have uh have deviated from the original what was good and what was evil right well though if we were talking about our at least at least my wife here it just reflected i think in this statement from the Colburn Bible for woman was inclined to be willful and unheeding of her responsibility. That sounds like they were all redheads, like my wife. But uh, so, are you a dead man now? <laughs> no, no. Believe me, we just we're, my wife and I much rather talk about that up front. The willfulness, especially. <laughs> but I mean, I think this is very interesting, and this is it sounds all very modern, but it's not. So then it gets into a little bit more about about men proving themselves worthy of a woman, and and then there's a but there's a couple of these creation stories too about how. Uh, men and women came to be, that men came from the earth and women came from water and stuff like that. So so what do you do with this Adam and Eve piece that's in there? Well, I want to interject one thing before we get into Adam and Eve. One of the reasons for the codes of chivalry amongst the Templars, and prior to that, uh, the codes of chivalry we often attribute to St. Morris in 280 A.D., uh, who was a fabulous Roman general. Uh, who, uh, when he was asked by Caesar to go and clean up the, or mop up the barbarian tribes in Western Europe, he went there and he found that these people were Christian. Uh, this is 45 years before the Nicene Council. Uh, what he did in those days, uh, the honor and the chivalrous nature of his being, uh, inspired the codes of chivalry at the time of King Arthur and later amongst the Templars. But notice what the Templars were blamed of, blamed for under the Western European uh, monarchs of the of the Middle Ages. They were blamed for being sexual deviants because they had high codes of chivalry, much of which left many of them celibate all their life because they felt like they had to work all of their lives to be worthy of a damsel's hand. And if they never became worthy, they never married. And it was reflective of their teachings from this Colburn manuscript. And from ages long past, long, long ago, um, this Colburn has inspired uh, behind the scenes cultures and generations that have long, long since gone. Well, that, I guess that's part of what's so intriguing to me is just because I've just never heard of it. I mean, until I actually had it in my hand, I'd certainly never read anything from it. And and so just sitting down with it, I think, you know, if this if this book is all that it's cracked up to be. 
uh, I could see where cultures have been influenced, especially when you get into some of the the chapters about about morality and wisdom. Let me ask you: Would you call this a, a Christian work? I most certainly would. Okay. And and the reasons uh, subsequent manuscripts talk more about the life of Christ. Uh, obviously, the last book of Britain, the Britain talks about Jesus and and has some of the words of Joseph of Arimathea, etc. Uh, but the subsequent works and, and some of the peripheral documents speak specifically about Christ. And there's another one coming, by the way, and I'll give you a copy of it when it's when the time is right. Okay. Uh, but uh, you're right. Uh, this this is this was the rationale behind the codes of chivalry during the time of King Arthur and during the time of the Templars. You see, but I wouldn't say this. I wouldn't look at this and say this is a Christian work. I think it, there's some Christian pieces in it, but those feel more kind of stapled on. It doesn't it, it, it sort of glued in at the end or in various pieces. What this seems much more like is to me is a very Celtic or kind of Druidic work, which is not to invalidate it at all. I mean, I, I just... I, th- I think that's what jumps out at me from these pages. Well, it, it comes to me, across to me like a, like a textbook, like a course of instruction, uh, more than a course of religious study. Fair enough. But it's the point of view. It's that very earthy point of view that I, that I get from this. And I could see where, you know, here's this tribe of people they call the children of God, and it's it's very respectful of its matriarchy and they look down their noses at you know the evil guys the children of men for the way that they're treating their women and and i i, I find that sort of much more tr- tribal in the sense of how i think of the ancient celts or the ancient scots than i think of uh than anything to do with christianity well i think they're all merged i think we're trying to okay. divide we're trying to divide a line uh, back uh, you know, before our day, uh, science and religion and cultures were all one course of study. Sure. Uh, we're, we're trying to define them in terms of our own perspective and our own coursework. Uh, which building are you housed in, in the, the historical department or in the religion department or in the mathematics section? Fair enough. Back in those days, they were all one building. No, you're right. I mean, it's just a feeling. It wasn't, uh, you're right. I think right. your observation is brilliant, Ian. Well, it, I, it, I guess the part, too, that I get to, and as I'm reading this, and maybe this brings us back to the Adam and Eve thing, is there really is an attempt for these people to try to understand the world, but there doesn't seem to be a very strong sort of catechism to it. It's sort of much more sort of a, a collection, it seems like, of some different points of view that are all collected under the same book. Well, that, that's certainly true. It, it's all-inclusive. Uh... It's reflective of the kinds of course studies that they taught in, in ancient Britain. Uh, once again, the dividing lines between the courses of study were are not the same that we would have in our day and age. You know, if we were to go take the divinity school training here in our day, we would learn strictly about spiritual things and Christ and crucifixions and, and ancient prophets and et cetera, et cetera, when in their day uh, the, the purpose for the earth the difference between good and evil and science and mathematics were all one study. Yep. Uh, that's the, it was all one idea. Okay, look, can I just say, just as a, you know, a relatively recent graduate of seminary, uh, I'm glad they didn't have any math. <laughs> that's really, <laughs> that's really, that would have really stunk if they had rolled in some math courses in there, but <laughs> anyway. Well, it's rumored that Tesla had a copy of the Colburn. Get out, really? Yeah. And that uh, that he was greatly influenced by some of the mathematics uh, that was uh, expressed in the in the Colburn. The Colburn has so many diverse perspectives that are possible. Yeah. That's why I said at the year in the in the former hour that this book uh, is the reason for science and creationism to resit at the same table. Because if in fact this book is real, which I attest that it is, because uh, for a variety of different reasons. Then, then the study of the origins and the creation of the earth and evolution and creationism and Jesus and Joseph of Arimathea and the Templars and all of these things are all one course of study. They all belong at the same table, and we have divided them as if we were having some contest, testosterone contest, between two rivaling points of view, scientists and religion people. 
Well, I, I, then that does bring us back to this thing about Adam and Eve and the origins of uh, of humankind in the book. Why don't you set it up that way? Well, you know, at the, it, by the time of the coming of Adam and Eve, the earth was well used by by the the Creator, whomever you wish that to be, or whatever design, intelligent design you wish that to be. Uh, certainly, I am a, uh, I am I come from a Western Christian perspective and have a uh, have a very serious feeling about that. Um, but Adam and Eve were not the first people on the earth. The Bible talks about the Nephilim. It talks about the sons of God. Uh, these sons of God are the very same sons of God mentioned in the Colburn that existed prior to Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve became the patriarchs of the final epic of this world. And, and, and the Coburn talks about them coming almost like they were coming from outer space, though they didn't come from outer space. They were sent here on, on some intelligent design. Certainly, uh, Western Christians would believe that God created them and sent them and brought them here into this world. But, that's, but you, let's amplify that other point, that there were beings here before, because in a way, that's not that different from the Bible in one sense, in that you know when um when Cain you know is banished from the garden and when Adam and Eve are sent forth there are other people already outside i mean because there are people that you know that they that at least Cain then begins to inter mingle with no doubt and who were so, those people so who are those people was always a question that people would ask how could there already be other people there if Adam and Eve were the first and they only had you know at that point two kids uh, and they add a third, but I mean that's where that's where this comes into because it, there were there were people here, and then the Adam and Eve story starts after that, without without any question. And the Templars didn't even understand the histories prior to those two civilizations. They divide them in half. They say the world was created and then recreated. I have a CD called Pre Genesis: The Time Before the Beginning, which chronicles five different separate epochs of time where there were human like the creatures on the earth, and all of them were destroyed because they had violated the laws of the earth and violated the laws of the Creator. Uh, it's amazing that uh, um, Plato mentions that the destruction of Atlantis occurred because these people violated the laws of the earth and the laws of the Creator. It almost sounded like he was making a religious comment when he said that. Mm. Uh, but in my CD, we chronicle all of them that have been recorded all the way from China, India, Egypt, all the way into the Americas with the Mayan text, there were five epochs of time that really uh, have existed in, in, on this planet. And Adam and Eve become the patriarchs of the final epoch of time. And all, of these, all the previous four civilizations all predicted a cataclysmic event, and all of them predicted a thousand years of, of peace, of prosperity, the return of Eden, the return of Atlantis, millennia era of time, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that that time would exist after this cataclysm, cataclysmic event would come. And and if you take into account the Mayans' prediction, they, they were great uh, mathematicians and astronomers, that epoch of time is eminent. Okay. So we should say then that the, how they become the uh, the patriarch and matriarch of the final epoch of time is that they are given the divine spark. They're given a piece of God. They that, came not from the actual bloodlines of the existing races. They came from without. Right. And so that's what makes them different. And that's what makes us different in that that's what's been passed down to us. And that's why, you know, if we look at it, that's why we're we're different from it's why we are the hominids that we are and the other ones didn't survive. That's exactly right. That's a very, very very mystical, very religious statement to make, but it's also very uh, very simple to understand. And that's why I claim that science and religion should sit back to the same table, because there may have been interventions in this evolutionary uh, saga that's written in the crust of the earth, and I've always said that. The crust of the earth is not the story of a gradual uh, evolution of organisms from primordial soup. It is the story of successful epics of 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 uh, life and their long existence and their destructions all right so we'll talk about those destructions coming up next the story of both the past destructions 
and the pending future one mentioned in the Colburn with Glenn Kimball on Coast to Coast AM. So I'm reading from the Colburn Bible here. I'm going to continue on with the part that I read a little while ago about destruction and recreation. Again, the Colburn Bible says that essentially there were two creations, uh, and we are in the part of time after the first recreation. And it talked about dragons coming down from heaven. You can interpret this any way you want, but I could sure see, Glenn, why some people hear this and they, in their mind, see spaceships. I mean, I could I could see why they would do that. Somebody emailed me about that this week. But here's why they said that. The body of the dragon was wreathed in a cold, bright light, and beneath, on the belly, was a ruddy-hued glow, while behind it trailed a flowing tail of smoke, which sounds a little bit like exhaust fumes, but anyway. It spewed out cinders and hot stones, and its breath was foul and stenchful, poisoning the nostrils of men. Its passage caused great thunderings and lightnings to rend the thick, darkened sky, all heaven and earth being made hot. The seas were loosened from their cradles and rose up, pouring across the land. There was an awful, shrilling trumpeting, which outpoured even the howling of the unleashed winds. Men, stricken with terror, went mad at the awful sight in the heavens. They were loosed from their senses and dashed about, crazed, not knowing what they did. The breath was sucked from their bodies, and they were burnt with a strange ash. Then it passed, leaving earth enwrapped within a dark and glowering mantle, which was ruddily lit up inside. The bowels of the earth were torn open in great writhing upheavals, and a howling whirlwind rent the mountains apart. The wrath of the sky monster was loosed in the heavens. It lashed about in flaming fury, roaring like a thousand thunders. It poured down fiery destruction amid a welter of thick black blood. So awesome was the fearfully aspected thing that the memory mercifully departed from man. His thoughts were smothered under a cloud of forgetfulness. Then it goes on to talk about more about what happens on the earth and the sky monsters and the sky monsters that were joined by other sky monsters battling above the earth. And it says, in this matter, the first earth was destroyed by calamity descending from the skies. Men and their dwelling places were gone. Only sky boulders and red earth remained where once they were, but amidst all the desolation of a few survived, for man is not easily destroyed. They crept out of their caves and came down from the mountainsides. Their eyes were wild and their limbs trembled. Their bodies shook and their tongues lacked control. Their faces were twisted and the skin hung loose on their bones. They were as maddened as wild beasts driven into an enclosure before flames. They knew no law, being deprived of all the wisdom they had once had, and those who had guided them were gone. What a, what a magnificent... I could listen to you all night, and I've read it myself many times, but you're right. What would happen in our day if we, if we had a cataclysmic event happen to us uh, we would go mad, too. And, and all of our technology, all of our mathematics, all our microcircuitry, all of these things would be forgotten in a madness of cataclysm. And that's what happened to these people. They came out of a civilization that had technology beyond our understanding. The technology to build the pyramids, the technology of even electricity, of 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 of, of who knows what in terms of uh, genetic recreations. Uh, of, of flying machines and of all kinds of things that have been rumored in, in, with uh, Michael Cremo and, 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 and company. And then suddenly they forgot it in a moment of cataclysm. And they started from scratch. And started from scratch. 
We'll That's it, why they forgot it. The Colbrin, the the Colbrin Bible, ancientmanuscripts.com, or you can link up to it through coasttocoastam.com. That's just part of the destruction of the past. What's What does the Colbrin Bible tell us about our future? We'll ask Glenn Kimball coming up next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. So we all know Glenn Kimball's story. He's got a master's of communication. He taught college for a while and has always been interested in ancient manuscripts. And uh, Glenn now brings us the Colbrin Bible, which we can purchase at a reasonable uh, price. Now, what are you selling the Colbrin Bible for, Glenn? Well, I didn't price it. It's uh, if you if it's shipped within the United States, uh, it's forty nine ninety five, and that includes shipping. Uh, it's a little bit more to ship it outside the country. Uh, but it's still a lot less than the other versions of this that exist. Yes, and, and if you go to the Ancient Manuscripts site, I give some specials, which include um, my CD, Pre-Genesis, The Time Before the Beginning, which is terribly critical in, in helping us understand this, and, and things like The Drama of the Lost Disciples, which has launched a hundred authors, a hundred different careers over the years. Uh, I combine them together to help mitigate those costs and bring it down to absolutely the barest possible scenario. They're a little bit pricey, I know that, but I can't help that. I, I didn't create this world that we live in, and I didn't price it. Uh, I, do, I wasn't involved in that end of it. Uh, All right. So we talked a little bit before about uh, some of the prescript, uh, some of the uh, uh, the projections out of the book of manuscripts. But let me ask you, what does the Colbrin tell us in terms of a timeline. You said 2012. You mentioned that in there. I mean, and are there particular signs that they said we should look for? I mean, other than when the sky starts dripping blood, I mean, are, are there things in the Colburn that say when X happens, you know, you can start packing a bag or, or making a, you know, a, a, a to go plate because you're not going to be sticking around here for long? Yeah, yes. And before, before I mention that, uh, uh this is a very extensive manuscript. This is not a pamphlet. It's huge. <laughs> it's uh, huge. Uh, part, if I, part of the price of this thing is the fact that you're getting the Encyclopedia Britannica of the of, yeah. the, the, of the coursework that was being taught at the time of Christ. It, it's already five, it's 500 pages long. And it's an eight and a half by 11 size book. You right. Know? So it's, I mean, it, you're, you're getting a value in terms of a lot of information for that money. And, and, and you and I can only touch on one 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 thousandth of what's in this text. I'll go along with that. Uh, uh, some things that are just enormous. But, you know, we, we talk about the signs of the times. Remember that the signs of the times are that the people violated the laws of the earth. And when they start violating the laws of the earth, then comes a problem. Well, there's a there's a flood story in, in the Colburn Bible, too. Oh, yeah, but we're talking about a different flood there. But we're, we're talking about two floods, yeah. Okay, does, go ahead. It talks about the flood of Noah, but it also talks about a flood long time before that. That was the flood uh, probably referenced from the time of Plato talking about Atlantis uh, and the floods that the, the, the uh, tsunamis that came and, and uh, covered this uh, continent-sized uh, 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 city. of. It's not a city. It's an entire country of Atlantis which was the the size of the sedan and and uh, uh et cetera was very very large the size of brazil you know uh and the only thing was left were seven islands the islands of the blessed but i, I wanted to make one more comment too before i forget it on the floor of the vatican in the saint peter's basilica and i, I you've been there have you been there Ian? no i never have well on the floor of the vatican is something very very strange they have the 12 zodiac symbols Right. Right there in marble on the floor of St. Peter's Basilica. Right. The ancient people who built the St. Peter's Basilica used those symbols not as astrology symbols. They used them to represent the 12 other planets which participated with our Messiah. And we were called the most wicked of all the creations. And so when you're talking about aliens, quote-unquote aliens... We're talking about these people had had reason to be uh, 
joined with us, reason to be a part of the same movement. Um, we were the most wicked of all the creations, and 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 that was the the words of the holy of uh, the prophets. Um, right. So. Okay. Well, does that put us closer though to understanding what that second flood was about, or the first flood for that matter too? I mean, they have a sort of a Noah story in here, and then uh, and then we have what else to worry about? What else is coming to us? What what's coming to us is the uh, the very last verse of the. Uh, the, of the Old Testament in the Holy Bible, Malachi says, Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, I will send Elijah the prophet, and he shall turn the hearts of the children to the fathers, and the fathers to the children, lest I smite the earth with a curse. This is the curse that he's talking about. This is a curse that has happened before on this earth. It has, ha- it has happened to civilizations of beings that inhabit our, our planet uh, before us, and it is predicted to happen again. Uh, and the one thing that's brilliant about the Cobra is that this is the only first-hand account of that cataclysm that, that is in existence today. This is a precious, precious manuscript. Um, if, you're, if you were a journalist writing about the end of the world and wanting to know what was going to happen, pick up a copy of the Cobra, for goodness sake, and you can read in detail what, what is predicted if we do not turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. If we start... If we start alienating ourselves from the traditions of our parents and violating the laws of the earth and violating the laws of the, 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 the supreme being or the, whoever you want to call it, we're in for some real serious trouble that will alter our future as it altered the, the, the people who were here on the earth prior to us. Okay, so I'll go with you on this, but again, help me out with some specifics. What are things that we're supposed to to look for or the things that are supposed to happen, the benchmarks on our way toward this final showdown? Well, this is one of them, where we begin to ignore the traditions of our parents. Of the 106 original universities in the United States, 102 of them were Christian. Now none of them are. Uh, we're, we're, we're at the point in our day when we're trying to, to tear up nativity scenes and take the, the, the Moses off of the... the the Capitol building, and uh, these are signs of the times where we've ignored our fathers. We've we've turned our hearts away from our parents. That's one of the signs. Okay. And the other sign would be where we alter the laws of of the earth, where we spill uh, pollution into the atmosphere, where we uh, where we start randomly using the genetic process as probably did our of our forebearers or the people who were here before and created these uh, these variety of species which included giants uh, Stephen Quill knows very well about that and the Yoslings which were the short engineer uh, brilliant minds but were commanded by God not, uh, Adam and Eve were commanded not to 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 breed with them though the though they were allowed to uh, or at least did inbreed or marry into other of the races of men that were right. here uh, but but there were there were we're just beginning to find the civilizations of, of the little people. Uh, uh, there was some news coverage on a, an entire city here uh, recently that was found that was totally composed of very short, very uh, uh, very proportional small people. Uh, and if you read the book Technology of the Gods, I mean they found one in in Wyoming of all places, where hmm. they, in in building a. Uh, a freeway, they broke into a cave and found one of these short people sitting there. And when I was with Zahi Hawass on, uh, in, in Egypt last year, he took me to the, to the tomb of the engineer who built the pyramid of Khufu, the big one there on the Giza Plateau, and guess what he looked like? Really? He a was midge- tiny. A, a little person? Little Let's... short guy. Hmm. Now, these were the, this is where the aberrations of... Uh, where they altered the laws of the earth and what was intended for this earth. And so when we when you ask about the signs of the times, we're watching them happen one after another after another. And, and uh... Yeah, but, you know, people would think about this, whether it's because of movie folklore or because of the book of Revelation, but you'll have very specific signs that, you know, a particular person will rise to power and 
they will do X and Y, and you will notice this, and these will be your signs. So, I mean, that's, I guess, part of what I was going for. But you, what you're saying is sort of more of a general sense of, of things breaking apart. Well, and I have tried specifically not to speak of prophecy in what I have done in terms of ancient manuscripts. Okay, why? Primarily because I'm not a prophet. Okay, but, but you can still, but, but you can still read about, somebody else's. Uh, pardon? You could still read us of somebody else's That's prophecies. Correct. That's correct. I could. But I tend to think that what people tend to do is they tend to look for tabloid issues like okay. uh, uh, ministries of healing or ministries of prophecy okay. rather than ministries of, of, of moral principles and character and, uh, and chivalry as the, in putting, putting it in the vernacular of the Templars. Those are the most important things. Uh, it's not. We we shouldn't be concerned about the, the the future as much as we would concern about uh, the principles that we, uh, upon which uh, human life was sent to this planet originally to do. Okay, but I haven't read the all of the Colburn Bible yet, and I will look forward to doing it. But are the there are sections though which really do get into prophecies? Do they get into specific things? Are there are there things? even without going and mentioning what they are, where they talk, you think, about modern current events? Uh, or are they just prophecies of things that happened at the time and have since been fulfilled? Uh, it, it alludes to a bunch like Nostradamus, and, and, I, okay. and, and I don't want to... I, I am not going to try and bring out a specific... At this, uh, that's just not my nature. Okay. Uh, if, you want, if you want to read into the text those kinds of things, go ahead. All right, I may... I tell you, I just want to leave the option open here, as I may do that during the news break coming up at the top of the hour. I may pull out some of those uh, prophecies and then read them before we go to open lines, before we we start people jumping in and and talking to you coming up, okay? All right. All right. So, but is this the whole story then? I mean, or is there, as you seem to allude to earlier, kind of a, the Colburn Bible 2 coming up? Oh, yes, and more. (laughs) So there ancient is manuscripts. There's a lot of ancient text. I I told Art Bell years ago, and how much I love Art Bell, and I owe him a favor. Someday I'll pay him uh, that favor back. He's going to be on tomorrow night, and he has what sounds like a very interesting show, by the way. So and, 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 and Art and, and Art, uh, if you're listening, uh, I am your deeply devoted fan. You want the keys to my car? Come pick them up. <laughs> What are you driving these days? Uh, who cares? He no, well, I know, but drive. well, it may he may care. He may it may not be an upgrade. I'm driving a Subaru. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. As long as it's in good shape, could be all right. <laughs> uh, but I told Art back years ago. I said uh, that there were five million texts dealing with what I called uh, five million. Uh, five million texts dealing with. Uh, the uh, apocryphal works dealing with the the life of Christ, dealing with the writings of the apostles, the disciples, and the broad periphery of the writings of the prophets, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Five have, million. Uh, that's what I told him at that time, and I think I'm being conservative. Now, where are all they? They're all, they're everywhere, uh, Ian. And if you looked in my library, you'd, you'd be realize I need to buy a home for my. Uh, books. <laughs> well, I have a lot of your books, and I think I mean I see. Thousands as being a pop a possibility, I see maybe even you could sell me on there a hundred thousand, but I mean, come on, five million at the in the in the Alexandria Library alone, there were seven hundred and sixty thousand texts, almost all of them dealt with subject matters like this. In fact, we got our Old Testament when seven priests from chosen from each of the tribes of Israel were sent to Egypt to retrieve them in about sixty eight b c and and it, of those seven hundred and sixty thousand how many of them dealt with subject matter like this? Nearly all of them. That gives you. That just gives you one cash. Okay. What, what's in the Vatican? Uh, you know. Uh, what's in the uh, Jesus College at Oxford and at Cambridge? And then you go to the Hindus uh, uh, into their libraries. Their their religious canon involves over seventy thousand texts. You get into the Buddhist libraries, and there are umpteen. Okay. All right. Well, but still. Five million. Well, I lo- I will look forward to that. Doesn't include South America. Or- okay. You win. You win. You win. There's five million. <laughs> I believe you. The Goldbrin Bible, Glenn Kimball Special Edition. It's out now. You can link up to it through coast to coast am dot com. I can pull some of the prophetic parts 
and I'll read them coming up after the top of the hour. We'll give you all the numbers you need to join in the conversation next with Glenn Kimball on Coast to Coast AM.